and then of course come over the, there you go. Okay, we're live. We are live. I see your elbow. <laughs> Oops, excuse me. Does this turn okay? Yeah, yeah. That's perfect. That's, That's right. Better. Okay. Yep, we're good. We're good. We're good. So much of a contrast from what we do, and but it was beautiful. I mean, it was a beautiful ceremony and that whole thing, and, and where they went with it, courtesy of technology, is interesting. But to see everything in white is striking. I'm surprised you've seen a new movie. I can't tell you the last movie. No, I, it's been a long time. But yeah. Well, the whole, uh, yeah, I'm kind of a Marvel freak, so I'm talking. Okay, are we good? Uh, yeah, we're, okay. we're on, we're on. Okay, we're on, good, sorry for that uh, little <laughs> bit of confusion this morning. What? <laughs> it's only nine at one. <laughs> oh, well, you know, we're going to let people uh, trickle on in, so, um, so we'll, we'll hang, hang out and maybe have a little conversation about what we talked about last week, and if you thought about it at all over the week, which I hope you did. Um, so if you've not been with us before, we're talking about the history of Christmas. This is our Advent series here in the Issues class. And um, I am Courtney McKinney Whitaker. I'm here with my husband, uh, who you may know as, past as Pastor Stephen. I don't know if he's in the screen. Uh, pop in the screen, there you go. Stephen. Where would you like Stephen to be in the screen, Jack? If he was just a little more this way, you'd both be right there here. You You're both in the screen. Oh, perfect. Okay. <laughs> He's like creepily looking over my shoulder. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, like like I said, we're talking about the history of Christmas. This is our second session, so um, we'll do a little review in case you weren't here last week or catching up. So let's see if this is going to work. Here we go. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about <laughs> Christmas in the early church and the medieval era, and. There's a lot to get through, a lot of like logical leaps and progressions that we kind of have to get our minds around. Um, so I may go pretty fast because I think, Jack, you said this will cut off at 10, no matter yeah. what. Okay. You know, for the audience out there. Right? Okay, yeah, we don't leave them out. You can keep going after yeah. that. Yeah, okay, thank you. Do I need to point it a certain way? Oh, yeah, go ahead and hit it, Stephen, because it, this, it worked the first time. Okay, so we talked last week about why why are we even here? Why are we learning about the history of Christmas, and why why is that a thing that we would want to do? Even I think a lot of the time, as I said last week, one of the things we fight against in history is is just that perception that it doesn't matter. Um, I don't know where that comes from, because I think it's really uh, <laughs> kind of obvious that it does matter because it, it got us where we, where we are today. Um, but but why, are, why are we here? Any new thoughts or things you thought about since last week, maybe over the week, um, as you were thinking hard about what, what we studied last week, I know. Um, anything come up for you? Well, I think history in many people's minds is slowly becoming nothing but a uh, secular holiday. Mm -hmm. It's not, not the spiritual holiday that we were led to believe or at least aimed at when we were kids. Because today, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you're bombarded on any media about advertising that you need you know, this for Christmas, you need that for Christmas. And it's nothing about anything else except items, mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and it starts with a toddler right on up to, I guess, people my age. Uh, and I, think, I find that 
very disturbing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it starts very early. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm old enough to remember that you never talked about Christmas till after Thanksgiving. You never talked about Thanksgiving until after New Year. I mean, uh, Halloween. Halloween. And mm -hmm. you never talked about Halloween until after events happened in sequence. Today, I mean, we're already talking about New Year's plans and what's going to happen after the New Year. And mm -hmm. it's just, we're trying to speed things up faster mm -hmm. and faster. Uh, maybe the idea of horse and wagon wasn't all bad. <coughs> but the one thing that I find really different is that Christmas has lost, at least in some respects, the spiritual thing that, that most of us were, looking, we were brought up mm -hmm. to understand. I mean, uh, the birth of the child, the, the whole Christmas story, whether it's, whether it's factual or, or otherwise, don't want to get into that argument, mm -hmm. uh, the story was fantastic and it meant a lot to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I think it's being told less and less. Uh, that's just my perception. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about, about some of those different different issues and how, how maybe that's looked over the centuries. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think certainly talk about uh, your childhood, and we'll get into it more in two weeks. Um, Post-World War II, certainly, you know, people, people th think of, I think church attendance peaked at like 59% of Americans, and that was actually like the highest level of church attendance we've, we've had in the United States, like, since it was mandated. Um, and partly because you go to church to prove, hey, I'm not a communist, right? <laughs> um, so, so that is, uh, certainly we'll, we'll talk about, it's, it, it's not, sometimes we have the idea of Christmas, or not Christmas, history is a linear progression, but when in fact it kind of, we'll go back and forth and, and, and do different things. Um, so yeah, anybody with any anything you thought about over the week? Anybody else want to want to share? I would just piggyback on what Bill yeah. said. Um, after last week, you you were talking about the non-Christian or the pagan influence, mm -hmm. and and I thought I thought I wasn't so much offended or anything like that mm -hmm. with the pagan influence. Um, what what I was disturbed mostly about is about the secularization of Christmas now and the commercialism that's that's there. Okay. So I'm just kind of piggybacking on what Bill said. It's yeah, that, you know. that bothers me. The commercialism bothers me much more than any of the other non-Christian influences. In interesting. That are there. Yeah. So we'll we'll talk more that two weeks. Uh, well, next week we're going to talk about uh, the Puritans and and their issues with Christmas. So you might find yourselves in more. Uh, more in sympathy with them than, than you might think. So, um, so yeah. So we'll we'll get into some of those issues in the next couple of weeks. It's not going. There we go. Okay. So last week you mentioned that just a little bit. We talked about the seasonal roots of the holiday, some of the pre-Christian midwinter celebrations, um, Yule and Saturnalia in respectively northern Europe and and sort of southern Mediterranean area. And I just want to remind you of the, that holiday three-layer cake that uh, Forbes gives us, where we have at the bottom that first layer is the seasonal celebration. And we talked about how this doesn't only apply to Christmas. You know, it can apply to a lot of different holidays. And then we get our religious or national overlay, which sometimes get uh, confused. And, and we'll, we'll go together. And then next week, and uh, especially in two weeks, we're going to talk about the modern popular culture. Uh, layer of, of that cake. Okay, so Christ is risen. What are you supposed to say? He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. Yeah, yeah. Risen. great. So happy Easter. <laughs> Why am I talking about Easter? It's like it's not the right time. Let's see. But it is. It's just taking a minute. There's a little lag. Okay, so early Christianity was Easter-centric, and I'm going to turn it over to Stephen a little bit here and let him uh, have the floor for the next few slides to talk about uh, some of the early early Christian thought. So early church, very big on Easter, resurrection, crucifixion. So for Paul is the earliest writings in the New Testament. He's very big, really more on the crucifixion than the resurrection. You don't hear him talk that much about the resurrected Jesus. 
a whole lot about Christ crucified. But the main holiday in the early church was Easter. That's when people uh, came and were baptized. They had a lot more uh, focus there. So it was reinforced by deaths of saints and martyrs whose feast days are generally their traditional dates of death. So you don't really celebrate the birth of all these saints or anything. You're often celebrating uh, their death dates. It's funny because actually, we're not going to talk about it today, but you think about December 25th as the holiday, some Christians argue it goes back, they date his birth based on his death. Of course, there are two different death dates in the Bible, too, for when Jesus died, so that confuses things uh, a bit as well. Okay. You went too far. So, uh, birthdays was death dates. So, Paul especially really thought Jesus was going to come back like two weeks from now. So let's not get too much of the changing culture, changing the world, doing too much, because what's the point? Jesus is coming back in our lifetime. Uh, that was kind of the firm belief. You start seeing the later New Testament in these what's called Catholic epistles, these universal epistles, that people are starting to realize, okay, Jesus is not coming back tomorrow. Let's start organizing what it means to follow Jesus in a more institutionalized uh, manner. So, but it was early on, earthly life doesn't matter so much because Jesus is coming back tomorrow. In the 18th, especially 19th century, you really go back to this during the Industrial Revolution for the owners of mills and things to be able to say to the people, hey, listen, you can work really hard and not get paid and have bad lives because guess what? This life doesn't matter. Jesus is coming soon. That's what matters. Same things were told to uh, enslaved persons in America. Often, theology is very much wed to economics. You can look at different trends in economics, and you'll see the tide of theology. The church and the state have often been together, and the state with economics to say, hey, church, proclaim this to keep the people sedated, set, mind somewhere else. Karl Marx talked about that a lot. So, early church, origin, he was one of the early Christian uh, theologians. He deserved, he wasn't a big fan of birthdays. He basically said birthdays are what sinners do. So, you skip the way pass. Well, you were talking about. Okay. So, only sinners rejoice. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the Pharaoh and Herod stay in the festival was birth by shedding human blood. So, the only birthday celebrations in the Bible, there are three. There's uh, Her Pharaoh, there's Herod, and then the sons of Job, who celebrate way too much. So all in the Bible, any celebration of birth is always put in a bad light. So that's one reason early Christians didn't celebrate birthdays, because the Bible doesn't look too kindly upon them. Next slide. So origin, only sinners rejoice over this kind of birthday. Uh, Filled with the Holy Spirit, saying, curse that day. The worthless man who loves things connected with birth keeps birthday festivals. So clearly, one of the earliest theologians, not big on birthday celebrations. The rest of the Greek world often was. So Caesar Augustus, uh, they were, he had a lot of big things of his birthday. Uh, he had told stories about he was you know, born from the gods. He was born to bring peace to the world a new kind of king. When he became coronation, they kind of celebrated his birthday. He printed coins that would say, you know, celebration of the Prince of Peace. And the season to celebrate his coming reign was called Advent. So a lot of the things we think about religious roots to Christianity were actually first Roman political roots. Uh, Gospel counts in the Mark, the earliest gospel, skips it, not important. John has some poetic language that we kind of tie to nativity. Really wasn't for that purpose. Questionable if John actually wrote that. It was added later to kind of have more of a, a Greek influence because John was written more in Asia Minor, written more of the Hellenistic world. So it was trying to kind of reach that group of people, tying in the idea of the Logos reason, philosophy, to the beginning of the book. Luke and Matthew, they add nativities. They are writing Luke to the Gentiles, Matthew to Jews, and Galilee. So Matthew is kind of 
writing in a way to give a counter narrative to the narratives of the rulers of Galilee, to Herod. Uh, if you're really interested in that, you go back on YouTube, December 2017. I have a couple sermons, one talking about how Matthew's whole narrative is really a counter narrative to the narratives of Herod. And Luke's narrative is really a counter narrative to all that Caesar Augustus was saying and doing. So they're trying to, the only reason they bring in the births is because these other influences were talking about the importance of their kings, their God's birth. And they're like, okay, well, if we're trying to worship Jesus, and all this stuff is about the births of their gods, the births of their kings, we need to tell a story too. And we need to tell it in a way that says we have a very different version of the world, vision for the world, than the kings of this world. So if you want to do a deep dive into that, uh, December 2017, there's some sermons that go into that more. So early Christians were not big on birthdays. Uh, did not have much scriptural evidence for Jesus' birth. You just have Matthew and Luke. They're very different. Uh, had no clue what Jesus' actual birthday was. Uh, neither do we. The first reference even to anybody thinking about the day of Jesus' birth was a guy named Clement of Alexandria in 200. And he names about eight different dates, not a single one of them, December 25th. Uh, you know, the earliest Christian writers, Irenaeus, Origen, never even mention an idea of Jesus' birth. You don't get the idea of December 25th till really uh, the 4th century. Okay. Sure. Tech team. <laughs> okay, so this map in the pink, you see, is the Roman Empire of its furthest extent. So the Roman Empire, the Greeks, you know, come first. They have their, their democracy and all, and all that. Athens, Sparta, their... Uh, culture kind of declines, the Roman Empire militarily conquers this whole area. However, that older Greek culture remains, and it's kind of, um, they, they've been militarily conquered, but they're like, but we're still smarter than you, and you're kind of, you know, it's like it's like the brains versus brawn, to be really reductive uh, in it. So what happens eventually, and the reason this is important for us today, is that this eventually results in an important east-west split in the early church. So you're gonna have roughly, even from where this fold is, you're gonna have your Latin speakers over here um, becoming the Western church, and then more your Greek speakers over here becoming the Eastern church. Let me just not be in the right place to make this there work. There we go, okay. So, um, yeah, so generally speaking, that divide is going to come between the Greek and the Latin speakers, and it's going to match that cultural divide between them. Um, so, you get to the 11th century, those strands are going to pull apart. They're going to create what we know as the Roman Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox churches. Because if you look at that space, that is a huge area of land to try to deal with under one so this is my big disclaimer. All of the theories about what we know about the beginning of Christmas, Epiphany, whatever, they're educated guesses. Okay? We don't know. There is so much in history we don't know. People think we, um, we, we should just be able to know, like, quote, unquote, historical facts. But, like, we don't. A lot of the time. A lot, a lot of the time. I mean, the, the evidence is, is not there. Okay, so Epiphany came first, interestingly. So if we look at, you know, Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Epiphany is the first one, and it starts in the Eastern Church, maybe as early as the 200s, but definitely by the 300s. And it starts as a celebration of Jesus' baptism, and then it sort of slowly shifts to become a celebration of the birth. So like the Armenian Orthodox Church, they still celebrate Christmas on Epiphany. So a week later. So a lot of the Eastern Church, they're celebrating, you know, a couple weeks after us, uh, their Christmas celebrations. Okay. So our first document that we have, you mentioned Clement of Alexandria. Our first document that gives us December 25th is the Chronograph of 354, otherwise known as the Philokalian calendar. It's kind of a... Um, uh, 
an almanac of sorts where they've collected maps and documents and just pulled in sort of a lot of the things that they that they have. And those dates are going to be 336 to 354. So you could have, it could have been as early as 336 that uh, we had that reference, but we don't know. It's sometime in that time period, though. It says, Christ is born during the consulate of C. Caesar Augustus and L. Amelanius Paulus on 25th December, a Friday, on the 15th day of the new moon. You always have to ask yourself, can you trust your sources? <laughs> Just because you have a source doesn't mean it's right. Oh, Stephen. The Western and Eastern branches um, of Christianity were going to slowly sort of absorb each other's customs. So by the 400s, we get Christmas celebrated on December 25th and Epiphany on January 6th. So it was sort of a, I'll do your thing if you do my thing, and we'll do both things. So why does this happen, though? Anybody have a guess who this is? Any guesses? This is Constantine. Constantine the Great um, ruled all or part of the Roman Empire from 306, 306 to 337, converted to Christianity in 312, completely changes uh, the course of not only Christianity, but, but world history. I cannot emphasize this enough. In this moment, Christianity went from being underground and illegal and persecuted to being the state-sponsored religion of the most powerful empire in the world. And Christians often argue whether that was a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> and you can make arguments both ways. Like with most things, you can see the benefits of it and what was lost because of it. So these are some things that this meant. We get our grand public buildings, we get our fancy worship services with our incense and our music and our fancy outfits. We can have public theological debates for the first time. And we get our powerful, politically motivated clergy. Often who turn evil. <laughs> <laughs> we can also have debates about the nature of Christ which is going to lead to sort of some greater concern about the mechanics of Jesus' conception and birth. Like, how did this actually happen? What does this mean for, you know, the divinity versus the humanity of Jesus? So I'm going to let Stephen talk about the Council of Nicaea. He's going to tell you a story that probably didn't happen, but he says that he's going to say it happened anyway. So like, <laughs> keep our... You know, we can disagree on that. I have to actually, I haven't read the journals in a while, but I think it's in Athanasius' journal. Can we trust Athanasius? <laughs> well, if you can't trust Athanasius, you can't trust. So, Council of Nicaea, one of the first, it's the first really largest council that their time to debate, in a lot of ways, who is Jesus? Is Jesus God? Is Jesus the Son of God? Because that seems to make it seem like Jesus is less than, or not exactly the same as God. Is Jesus the firstborn of creation? There's a guy named Arius who says, Jesus is really cool. He's like the tip-top most awesome created thing ever, but not God. And Aries can point to a whole lot of scriptures that are that would seem to be on Aries' side. But then others, especially that in the Eastern Church, look at John's gospel, the word where was God, that was with God. And well, according to our favorite gospel, John, Jesus is the same as God. So ha to you, Arius. <laughs> so there's a big argument. Eventually, legend has it that Constantine's like, well, let's use this word homoousius, which means same substance. Uh, basically, you have this idea, and some of the creeds come out of this, that Jesus is true God from true God. That's in a favorite Christmas carol, uh, true life from true life. So there's uh, Athanasius wrote a, a creed that the Nicene Creed is very similar to. The Nicene Creed comes from, guess what, the Council of Nicaea. Now, the story goes, that I happen to like, and it's at the St. Nicholas Center's website, too, with the St. Nicholas Center, my view, <laughs> is that there was a saint, a uh, bishop at the time, Nicholas from Turkey, who was at this council. He and Arius get into a bit of a spat. Nicholas, of course, being from Turkey, follows more the Gospel of John, believes in the full divinity of Christ. He slaps Arius upside the face. 
then he gets kind of punished for that, because the bishop shouldn't be slapping other people in the face. But, you know, Santa Claus is a good defender of orthodox theology. He'll punch you in the face, so you better watch out. You better not pout. You better not say Jesus is the Son of God. Santa will come to your house and slap you in the face. Now, did that really happen or not? Yeah, we can look. Have I done a deep dive into it? No. Could we probably, I might do that now, because I'm interested in it, because there will be records of whether Nicholas was actually uh, punished in some way or something from um, that council. But Athanasius kept a journal, and that's where the story comes from. But of course, do journals lie? Yes. Maybe he had something against Nicholas. Maybe he wanted to spice things up. Like, if you ever watch a historical show on HBO, like John Adams or anything else, or any movie based on historical events, they sometimes try to, like, spice things up a bit for entertainment value. So Athanasius might have wanted to spice things up a bit. So uh, the Council of Nicaea is the first council that looks into, okay, how is Jesus fully God? It's a bunch more after that. There's... Uh, Chalcedon, there's Constantinople in 381, Chalcedon in 451, all looking at, okay, how, how is Jesus fully God and fully human? Uh, what does it mean for Mary to be the mother? So you have this whole thing about this idea of Theotokos, being the mother of God, what benefits does that give her? So you get a lot more interest when you're trying to define who Jesus is is, you often go to the beginning. Well, how was Jesus born? What does that happen? So you're looking at the narratives of other people like Augustus and other gods. You're looking at the biblical stories, and they're trying to figure out how do we define Jesus. They go back to the beginning. So that's when you get more interest in the nativity stories than any other time to try to define Jesus. Okay, so why, why December 25th? The answer is we don't know. And if you take one thing away from this, please take that. Um, educated guesses, these are some of them. Getting in competition with the rival Roman religions. Um, there's a conscious co-opting of, of the natural sort of pre-existing Roman uh, and Mediterranean parties that are happening at this time. Um, and then there, there's the idea that we might infuse Roman celebrations with Christian meaning. Um, which is something maybe you guys were talking about a little bit earlier, where, you know, yeah, we have these celebrations, but what is the focus on? Um, so those are, those are just some of them. There's also another whole theory, uh, and there's been several writings, especially out of North Africa, Augustus, where they date Jesus' death, which would have been March 25th, and this whole tradition of holy people being born and dying on, on being conceived on the same kind of day. So they work it back, uh, you know, conception and birth, and they actually name December 25th then as the date. And there's two different ways they did that in both the Orthodox and the Catholic Church using different dates and methods, and they both come to December 25th. So then some argue, well, there's more of a, a Christian reason, but that doesn't really happen until the 5th century. And December 25th was named in the late 3rd century as the key holiday for the Roman Empire, like Saturnalia. So were they trying to find a legitimate reason to do these other things Courtney just said? But think about, like Constantine says, oh, by the way, you're all converting. <laughs> and by the way, you can't have your big party anymore. <laughs> you know, that would not probably go over very well. Um, so this, this I, I, I want to read because I think it's really important. Um, this is from Stephen Nussenbaum, who wrote The Battle for Christmas, which is still the sort of standard text. Um, the decision was part of what amounted to a compromise, and a compromise for which the church paid a high price. Late December festivities were deeply rooted in popular culture, both in observance of the winter solstice and in celebration of the one brief period of leisure and plenty in the agricultural year. In return for ensuring massive observance of the anniversary of the Savior's birthday, assigning it to this resident date, the church, for its part, tacitly agreed the holiday to, the, to allow the holiday to be celebrated more or less the way it always had been. From the beginning, the church's hold over Christmas was, and remains still, rather tenuous. 
There were always people for whom Christmas was a time of pious devotion rather than carnival, but such people were always in the minority. It may not be going too far to say that Christmas has always been an extremely difficult holiday to Christianize. And I think we saw some of that, um, we saw some of that in, in what Stephen was just saying about their really difficult efforts to try to make this fit. You know, we'll see, we'll see more of that. I think I talked about some of the legends that spring up where they try to make the Christmas tree like about Martin Luther and like it's not, but you know, you know trying to make those, those fit. Um, so 476 is a really important date. It's the fall of the Western Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire had kind of, you know, it's, it's not like it happens in this one date. I mean, this is the date that we, that we have, but it, of course it's in decline, it's breaking up, you know, sort of all around this time. Um, and that's, that's key, this sort of delivers us into what is commonly called the Dark Ages, those sort of late 300s, um, period where things are in chaos, where um, you have s bunches of like small city-states being run by sort of these like mafia, mob bosses <laughs> type type of thing. Um, not, not literally, but, but you get what I'm saying, like it's kind of crazy. So the Council of Tours is sort of our next big date, and you actually switched me before I was ready to go, okay, yeah. but <laughs> it's okay. Um, but we can leave it there. Um, I just wanted to mention, yeah, when everybody was talking about like, oh, 2020 is the worst year in human history and blah, 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 and I was like getting really annoyed about that um, <laughs> back back during 2020, several historians got together, it was like a panel, and they were like, okay, let's let's figure this out. If people are going to insist that this is the worst, I think they, they came up with 536. 536 was the worst year to be alive. If you had to pick one, 536 was awful. It was, you know, massive, widespread crop failures, uh, plague, war, everything just was bad. So they're like, you know, this is hardly no worst. Netflix. Even. No Netflix. <laughs> I mean, hard, hardly the worst year in, in human history. Okay, but by 567, the Council of Tulloch declares that the period between Christmas and Epiphany should be part of the celebration, and that creates the 12 days of Christmas. Um, Guess how long Augustus' celebration of to celebrate his coronation was in December? <laughs> 12 days. 12 days! <laughs> okay, and then 601, as Christianity starts to spread outward from the old Roman Empire, um, Pope Gregory I, otherwise known as Gregory the Great, he establishes an explicit policy of accommodation with native religions and customs. So what does this mean? Go ahead and move me forward here. He's, he writes, he writes, the idol temples of that race should by no means be destroyed, but only the idols in them. When this people see that their shrines are not destroyed, they will be able to banish error from their hearts and be more ready to come to the places they are familiar with, but now recognizing and worshiping the true God. Thus, while some outward rejoicings are preserved, they will be able more easily to share in inward rejoicings. So he's like, it's basically, you can keep all your stuff that you like, but it's going to be Christian now. That makes sense. Okay, so this is another fun uh, model that Forbes gives us. He says Christmas is like a snowball. Not one that you throw, but one that you roll. So he says, like, as it's, if you're making a snowman and you're packing that snow, and you're rolling it through your yard, it's picking up all sorts of things and dropping all sorts of things. You know, you get your sticks and your mittens and your little pieces of grass and rocks and whatever. Um, and he says, it's going, it's going like a snowball. It's, it's as it rolls through uh, all of these areas, mostly in, in central and northern Europe, Scandinavia, it's picking up some things, it's dropping some things. Things are spreading. Things are, are pulling back. So it's like we end up with this sort of Christmas soup of traditions and uh, things pulled from different places and different times and, and different um, situations. So go, go ahead. Okay, so we're going to talk about St. Nicholas, who's a great snowball case study. Now, I don't see any, any young ones in, in here. If anybody's watching uh, at home, you might 
you may be the judge if, if you want your younger children uh, to continue to watch it, watch us talk about this, this history. Um, so this is our established history of the man we know as St. Nicholas. He was Bishop of Myra in the fourth century. And that's it. That's all we know for absolute certain. Because people, I mean, I told you this is a crazy time. Records are either not being kept, they're being lost, they're being destroyed. They have a very, even a very different notion of truth than we do. Different notion of um, what is evidence. You know what, what can what can we say is true? Right now, <clears throat> with Saint Nicholas, and even very early on, the history and the legend just got so intertwined that we can't even pull them apart because you pull on one thread and you're going to pull, you know, the whole uh, the whole thing's going to sort of fall apart, get tangled. Um, in 1969, papal decree changed St. Nicholas B's status from universal to optional, and the, along with about, I think, 92 other saints. And the reason for that was not to be a jerk to St. Nicholas, it was just um, that so little was known that they felt like they couldn't. I have no water, please. But, as we often say, um, the stories that we tell, you know, are just as important for understanding a culture as maybe what the actual truth of what literally happened was. So when we think about this, think about what do the stories tell us about what people believe and about what's valuable to them. So from the legends, I'm not gonna get into all the legends right now, you can look, look that up. Um, we could do a whole class on just on the, the legends about St. Nicholas. Next year. <laughs> okay. So he cared for children and young people, was generous, was a gift giver. Um, Cared for seafarers, travelers, merchants, bankers, and pawnbrokers. He's the patron saint of, of all of those things. But essentially, he functioned like, sort of like a guardian angel. And it was this idea that there's somebody watching over you, and there's somebody who cares about you. And he sort of became, was able to become all things to all people. You know, for people, at, uh, for sailors, St. Nicholas rules the sea. For uh, farmers, as, he, as his legend and, and his... Um, persona moves into Ukraine and Russia and that area, um, he becomes a, a person who, who guards the crops. You know, but the idea was that he was very much this benevolent, kind presence that would sort of watch over people who needed watching over. So December 6th was uh, his traditional date of death, as we said earlier. Uh, saints are Typically, uh, Saints' Days are observed on their traditional date of death. So that became St. Nicholas Day. And he was a really very popular saint, as I just said, especially um, in the East, in the Eastern Church. Uh, and his celebrations just happened to be in the same month of Christmas. Um, so, so this is an interesting story. you got to go on the pass. That's okay. This is, this is a great story. Um, can you make my water, please? So, in 1087, the town of Bari in Italy decides they're going to steal St. Nicholas's body, his remains. Now, why are they going to do that? He's buried over in Myra, and it's Dim Dimre, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, it's D-E-M-R-E, -E, Turkey. His remains are in Turkey. Now, you have to understand, in the Middle Ages, people loved them some saint's relics. You got a finger bone, you got a, you know, you got about 18 million pieces of the true cross floating around. Um, you know, they think that they're really powerful, and they'll create shrines to them. And the folks in Bari, they're thinking, huh, well, what if we got St. Nicholas? Because he's like a really popular saint. And if we had St. Nicholas, people would come to our town and they would spend a lot of money. So seriously, I mean, this is, this is true. Church fellowship activities of the van. <laughs> okay, I don't even have the whole thing here. Venice finds out that, that Bari is planning to do this. Venice is like, well, that's a really good idea. They race to Myra, to Turkey. They're like, it's like the Amazing Race. They're like going against each other.
each other, seeing who can get to St. Nicholas's tomb first to steal the remains. Now keep in mind, this is like 600 years after he, after he dies, right? I mean, there's not a lot left, probably. But it doesn't matter if it's real. It's what people think is, is real. So they succeeded. Vari got there first. They stole what they say is the entire, you know, set of remains. Um, <clears throat> now, Venice says that, well, you know what, Vari, you didn't get everything. We got some finger bones here. So everybody come see our St. Nicholas finger bones, you know. Um, see if you can get some, some blessings from them. Uh, Myra says, well, you didn't even get the right body anyway, so haha, we still have it. <laughs> Yours isn't real. So, There's three tombs of Mary in Jerusalem. <laughs> now, just our mentality is very, very post enlightenment. <laughs> to us, that is impossible. For people in the Middle Ages, I mean, one thing I love about, about people in the Middle Ages is they could believe anything. They were like, sure, it could be, it could be possible. And it's not stupid. It's that idea that has given us so many of the technological innovations that we have. Um, suspension bridges are imagined in the Middle Ages. Um, scuba equipment and deep sea diving equipment imagined in the Middle Ages. They're like, it could work. We don't know how, but it could work. And you have to get that, and you have to have the idea first, you know? Um, so it worked like a charm. Bari got really popular. They built a big church of St. Nicholas. Um, crusaders would stop there on their way to the Middle East to be blessed by St. Nicholas, um, spending their money, you know, as Bari had intended. Economics um, and the church have always <laughs> been tied together. Led to increased, this led to the increased popularity of St. Nicholas in the West. So, because he's there, I think uh, Urban preaches the first crusade, and um, he, he actually preaches the first crusade from the Church of St. Nicholas in Bari. So, you may go, go on, but that's, uh, so, so by the 1100s, French nuns are secretly giving poor children gifts on the eve of St. Nicholas Day, which would be December 5th. Um, and then, St. Nicholas Markets, I think they still have St. Nicholas Markets, like they're still around, they're still called that, developed, and it's a, a place for parents to buy gifts for children. And that concept of giving gifts to children on St. Nicholas Day spreads throughout uh, Europe. Um, yeah, it, through this period, with, with each area sort of putting its own spin on things, and you get a lot of different traditions that, that come from different places and sort of all come together. So. Until, dun dun dun. Who are these guys? Anybody identify them? Four horsemen of the Luther's up with the Okay, so we got Luther. Who's this guy? Calvin. Mark. That's. Yeah, that's Calvin. Calvin. Yeah. Who's this guy? He's our very own. David Knox. <laughs> Not David Tennant, John Knox. John Knox. David Tennant played John Knox. Okay. And this guy? Cromwell. Cromwell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so I'm not so mad at Luther because he didn't really, he just got the, got the ball rolling, sort of, so to speak, um, on the, uh, the Protestant Reformation. But then we have Calvin, then we have John Knox who studies under Calvin, right? Uh, kind of, okay. And then we have Oliver Cromwell. Um, not clergy, but um, military. So again, we have that military, church and state type of thing going together. And so you can go ahead and advance us. So next week we're going to talk about the Protestant Reformation, or there's a document called The Trial of Old Father Christmas. And basically what's going to happen is the as I said, you may find yourself feeling a little bit more in sympathy with some of these folks because they're very much their thing is like Christmas isn't um, 
spiritual. It's not biblical. It's, it's really just a secular holiday. And they, they ban it. I mean, they have a, a war on Christmas, really. And it's, um, if you want to talk about a war on Christmas, these guys actually had a war on Christmas, like literally had a war on Christmas with guns and cannon and, like, you know, the whole, the whole thing. So, um, so that's what we'll be talking about next week. How are we doing on time? Yeah, 15 minutes. This week. Okay, 15 minutes. Are we at 9.45? Yeah. I was afraid I wouldn't be able to fit it all in. So, um, I kind of got to show you, we talk about, you know, as, you know, we're kids, we have this, like, spiritual idea of Christmas, and we're losing some of that. But it goes in stages, because, you know, when we're talking next week, get closer if you want to be in. they talk, you know, we'll talk next week about how they thought Christmas wasn't ever spiritual, and let's get rid of it. And then spirituality has always been kind of added to Christmas at different times heightened, so we might long for that. When we have the larger big view of history, you don't get quite so mad because Christmas wasn't always the spiritual holiday. You know, it, it comes in these waves. And sometimes that wave may be 20 years long, uh, or 10 years, or 200 years. But it comes and it goes. Uh, and I think in two weeks, we'll really talk more about economics and Christmas. Something needs to be thinking about. We often lament the commercialization. But one of the biggest drivers of the US economy is Christmas. So if you didn't have it, wasn't commercialized, we'd be complaining. There aren't enough jobs. Businesses are shutting down. Uh, taxes are going through. And all these different things. You took commercialization out of Christmas, <clears throat> tons of jobs would be lost. Tons of business would go down. We'd have a lesser GDP. So then people would be like, oh, no, we need something. We'd make up some other holiday to try to find a driver of the economy. So some people could just say, hey, we like that it's such an idea around Christmas because it puts more emphasis on it. Other people say, we don't like it. Let's have the commercialization be somewhere else. But we do want the commercialization somewhere because we need that large economy boost. So it's like so many things to give and take. I remember you know, people often complain about like Black Friday and like, oh, you know, Thanksgiving holiday. People shouldn't be going out shopping. We had a conversation in a previous church about it. And it was really interesting because some people worked at retail and they said, we love this day. Without it, we wouldn't survive. I wouldn't have a job. So please don't convince people not to shop. You're hurting me. And some people need to hear that. And somebody else, uh, a person who was about 70, uh, never married, single, said, you know, that's one of my favorite days of the year. I go with friends. We go out and shop. It's a, it's a time for me to have community. So when you say it is back to do this, that's my one really big time. You're insulting me. So it's always more complicated. We love to lob grenades at folks. Uh, you shouldn't do that. That's a time to be with family. What I don't like to lob real grenades at folks. That too. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, we don't always, some people say, you know, I need that overtime. Hey, I want to work. I need it. Um, so we often go back to we judge people's decisions not knowing the full stories of why they do what they do, why they go there, why they need this holiday, why they want the Christmas commercialization. So kind of be thinking about those things for two weeks we talk about that, and then next week especially as we look at the, the Reformation and, and Knox. I, mean, I said earlier, often, you know, sometimes the Christian leaders can be the bad guys. In the latest movie of Mary Queen of Scots, the main villain in the story is John Knox. He's the bad guy. Because uh, not all these church leaders are these super holy people. And sometimes the choices they made that they thought were the right choices, we look back on history and say, well, that was kind of a jerk choice. Uh, you know, we, we lose a lot because Cromwell destroys a lot of stuff. But he thought he was doing the holy thing, maybe. You can get into his motivations. Did he think that? I mean, I could so, any questions, comments about anything you learned uh, today? If you are interested, can I put the book there? Where did I put that book? Oh, it's right there. If you're really interested in like, more of what the Bible actually says about Christmas, there's a good book. I think it's in the Hammond Library upstairs, The First Christmas by Marcus Borg and John Dominic Ross. Uh, I don't agree with everything they say, but they're pretty good researchers 
of the early church, the biblical manuscript, the different manuscripts, to kind of get a sense of what might have been real of the story, what was probably completely made up of the biblical narratives, why they might have told these things. It's often, as Courtney said, the tr different ideas of truth. We are so much post enlightened in this math truth of we have to have empirical evidence that something happened. What they often talk about is not so much did this happen, they don't care. Why are they telling this story? What's the reason they tell this story? That's the important thing to get about with Christmas. It's kind of like with Jonah and the whale. If you can debate about whether Jonah was swallowed by a fish and survived three days, then you can get lost in that. Why was the story told? That's the important piece. Why was this story told about a census and going to Bethlehem? And no room in the inn or the guest room, depending on which translation and how you want to interpret that. Why is story about Magi from these? Why is story about Herod wanting to kill the baby? Why the story about going to Egypt? Did all those things happen? Good chance they didn't. There's no evidence anywhere in any document that a bunch of male babies were killed during that time. And if you know anything about Jewish history, they will report when bad things happen to them. Somebody will write that down somewhere. No evidence anywhere of that happening. So did it happen? Probably not. Why did they tell that story? That's what's important to dig. Kind of like what Cordy said about St. Nicholas, the legends and things. But why did they tell those stories about St. Nicholas? It gets to something deeper about human need. And it gets to something we talked about last week of why all these holidays during this time of year. It's a universal need. So if you want to learn more about early Christmas, you can read this book. Or you can get it from the library here library elsewhere, buy it on Kindle, whatever. Yeah, so we have a few minutes, so um, if you need to go, that's fine. Um, but I kind of like to open it up for questions and discussion about anything that we talked about today, or thoughts, or whatever. I think it's kind of fascinating where you talked about Constantinople, how the church conveniently latches on, and Stephen, you're, you're always talking about context and how important that is, about the equinox and the solstice, their celebrations have gone on for millennia. Yeah. And the church conveniently <clears throat> hotels onto these things so that they can sell to the masses right, right. their point of view. Yeah. It's like with Easter. People, you know, always talk about keep Christ in Christmas. They don't they conveniently leave out that Easter, the name Easter, comes from a pagan fertility goddess. And we have no problem saying happy Easter in the church. But that, the name of the holiday, we celebrate Christ's resurrection, pagan gods. <laughs> and actually that's only in English of the, um, the sort of northern European languages. Most of them uh, actually do have the, the, the posh root, which is, is that, is that Latin? Or? Yeah. That, that's more the, the, the uh, like in, in French, for example, Easter is pop. Um, and it's, it's, the, it's actually the, the more Christian root word. Um, English is the only one that, that keeps the, um, or acquires, I guess is a better word, the, uh, the pagan fertility goddess name. Um, English is kind of fun. Um, yeah. But I, I think all civilizations throughout time have, have found reasons to celebrate. Mm -hmm. And, and one of the most important things about all celebrations is during that period, you, we are all generous. It is by definition one of, of excesses, if you will. Mm -hmm. and, and we celebrate with each other. And in that celebration, you bring other people into your family. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the affluence, if you will, of the time, even though it's not real, you, you generate it. Mm -hmm. and, and the concept of caring and, and, and inclusion occurs in celebrations. So every day should be a celebration. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the Muppet Christmas kid. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like every day Christmas. Yes. So on Christmas morning, Sunday, we're doing a series of, on Advent. Sometimes we wait, but sometimes something else. So on December 25th, we're talking about sometimes we celebrate. 
and we usually you know make that Sunday kind of a storytelling Sunday. And I'll tell a little story from uh, one of the chapters of Rory Ingalls Wilder's book where you kind of talk about, you know, you don't have a lot, but still it's you find a way to make it generous and celebratory because yeah. that's what you need at that time, and that's what you do, exactly like you're saying. Yeah, it, it, the, a lot of theater is, is about creating that environment, that, that excitement, which need not have any reality to it at all, but th that excitement, that caring, gets you so out of yourself that you are open to others around you and you make yourself available to them and them to you. And it's because you create this, this celebration and it's, it's why it exists everywhere. We, we can't survive as lone entities. Mm -hmm. We need that community and this is our doorway to it. Goes to that cake, you know. You all you have these seasonal celebrations, and eventually, whether it's a nation or a religion, says we like this. Yeah. We're going to add our thing to it, and yeah. then eventually, just the culture says, okay, all this stuff. We're going to create our thing, and cultures just move like a river. You never know, but it's going to carve a path. Culture is going to carve the path where it wants to carve the path, yeah. and so any holiday is going to take on what the culture needs in that moment. No matter what the government or the church says, it's like water cutting through rock. Eventually, it's gonna carve its own path. And you can't try to separate Christmas or Fourth of July or Veterans Day or Memorial Day or Easter from what the culture starts making it because the culture is water. It's always gonna be more powerful than the government, the church, the civic group, whatever, because that celebration is eventually just going to drive and create its path. And that's what we'll talk more about, how the culture kind of created its Christmas and things get added on. We, what we have today is, in large part, culturally driven. Any other final thoughts, theories, snipe remarks? I hope you'll continue uh, to think about this through throughout the week because I, I I find it um, I find that it really enriches my holiday and my celebration of the holiday to understand all of these things um, and to sort of have a greater perspective and um, just a sense of context maybe and to be honest like I find it nothing short of miraculous that we are still celebrating in many of the same ways as our ancestors were like four thousand years ago. I mean, I think that's really cool, honestly. Like, so, so I think I think that's um, I think it just makes everything more meaningful when we can understand sort of where, where it comes from. So again, um, let's see. No, okay. Here's my shameless plug, shameless plug. <laughs> for my website and my new ebook that I just wrote. Um, so I hope that you will check it out. Um, it's, designed to help you understand more how to think like a historian and um, sort of get some of those some of those ideas. So check it out. Next week we will talk about um, the Protestant Re Reformation and sort of the literal war on Christmas. <laughs> we talked talk about the war on Christmas but they had several actual wars. So um, not entirely you know just about Christmas but it was it wasn't not about Christmas. So let's say that. Um, okay, so I think we're, we're all finished for today. Thank you so much for coming and, listen, and uh, hanging out and, and listening. And um, you can entertain your friends with the story about Santa Claus. Still <laughs> it's interesting how we're looking empirically at untruths. <laughs> <laughs> right, you right. Know, we, we want to put the pieces together. Right, to make right. Sense. Yeah, because we're, we're empirically. Post, we're post enlightenment. So, However, it yeah, came about. that's just the way our brains are trained, and no. it's hard to ever step out of that because we take those things for granted. So, okay, Jack, I'm gonna. We're good. Thank you. Are we done? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no problem.